Today uh, we are here because uh, we wish to share a story, a story that is uh, related with what some people call the third industrial revolution. I guess this word might uh, sound a bit scary, no, in the post-election Greece. Uh, uh, many of you have uh, maybe seen uh, this article that it has been published in The Economist a couple of uh, weeks ago. And this revolution is uh, very much related with the production methods. So, uh, with very simple questions of, for example, how did we use to produce our things uh, before the Industrial Revolution? And uh, more importantly, what are the means that we will be having and how we will be able to produce uh, in the near future? Uh, if you think, for example, the um, the process of the design and production that we have been experiencing the last almost 200 years, it's a very simple uh, model. Experts are designing, some other experts are uh, producing, and what do we all do as a mass? We are actually consuming what the others are creating. So uh, the revolution that we are glad to be part in is, is uh, trying to change this model. So uh, it's very much related with offering to the people the opportunity uh, and the means to produce their own things, so to produce the object that they need to consume. Um, let's take, for example, the furniture. Let's take, uh, let's take the chair. How did we use to produce the chair uh, in the 10th or the 13th century? So it has been produced locally, uh, craftsmanship, uh, as, as you all know. And uh, certainly the most important thing is that this uh, chair is unique. But what is happening in the Industrial Revolution? Uh, the automated machines are coming, so the chair is being produced in billions of same copies, and more importantly, far away from where the chair is going to be used, so in the centralized factories. And uh, the question is, what do we envision that, um, how, um, how do we envision that we will be producing this chair in the near future? So uh, this, for example, is a chair that uh, we have designed and we have produced in our laboratory, in, in our digital fabrication laboratory in Barcelona. Uh, it's a chair that it has been designed by people that they are no designers, and it has been a chair that we have fabricated there with people uh, that they are not fabricators either, so they are not experts in construction. And this example of those chairs, uh, it represents uh, the idea of the personal fabrication. And the fab labs, therefore the laboratories where those objects are being produced, they are representing the platforms uh, that they are trying to offer uh, those tools to the people. So the fab labs think that they are um, very small scale workshops, uh, that they have quite high tech, but not so expensive machinery. Uh, let's say, for example, 3D scanners, 3D printers, uh, there are milling machines, there are laser cutters, and um, uh, it's a bit, uh, 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 it's a bit uh, um, an idea where uh, a platform, an open platform where people are, are going, uh, are coming to us, actually, and uh, we help them make things. So um, the digital fabrication laboratories, they are almost trying to change um, uh, the idea of the mass production. So if you think, for example, the first computer, the ENIAC, uh, the first computer had the size of the room. Uh, so uh, we have passed from uh, the personal, uh, we have passed to the personal computation, actually, with Steve Jobs and uh, with the PC, and we are envisioning that with the same way we will be passing to the personal fabrication, which is what we are doing in the Fab Labs. So that's correct. Um, Thinking about Fab Labs and thinking about what happened with uh, personal computing, th it brought us to a new literacy. When computers appeared into our lives, we changed the way we do things as well, no? Uh, I remember when I was at school, uh, I was doing everything by hand, writing and delivering the papers, just written by myself. And now most of the tools that kids and ourselves use are just digital tools by the use of computers, personal computers. and. Um, what, what is funny is that we, we have adopted that te those technologies and most of us, we are not digital natives. We actually were born in an age where the computers didn't appear to us and we adopt them and we change the way we did things. What is happening today with the kids is that if they see a TV, they try to swap 
the screen directly, no? <laughs> so they they are digital natives, uh, natives. So they know how to use these tools. It's not like your like your mom, and they, she always said that I will never use the computer for anything. And now I just got scared when I saw your mother added you as a friend. So <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and then people is changing their entire profiles in Facebook because they got, you know, were part in everything and now they are, you know, uh, hanging around and being saints. But what is happening now is that we are getting, let's say, beginning another step of literacy and think about how personal fabrication is going to change the way we produce and the way we actually use tools. So these Fab Labs, are actually, as, as Aleti said, there are platforms for people to go there to produce and to share ideas with others, no? And when we are talking about whoever, we're talking about whoever, people with no technical training, like kids. So these are uh, part of a Fab Lab Kids program that these are just 10 to 14-year-old uh, kids no? uh, that have been part of this four-year-long program. And we have examples as, uh, as Khalil, uh, Khalil came to the lab when he was 14, and he was in a b this difficult uh, age when you are a teenager, and actually he was not wanting to, stu to study anything, and he came, and he just realized that he could, he could produce an electronic board and program it. And now, today, four years after, Khalil is studying in one of the best school of schools of design in Barcelona, in Elisaba, and he's still attending to the Fab Lab and actually related what he does uh, in the school with the, with the laboratory. In the same way, Leon and Joan, this is a very funny story because I also remember when I was a kid and uh, I, was, I was in the skateboard thing, you know, and then I went on a skateboard and I was trying to manipulate my mom, telling her how good I was, you have to buy me this skateboard, I am the best, etc. But these kids are not learning how to manipulate, they're learning how to make their own skateboard. And they did this, this skateboard by themselves, and besides they did them, they actually customized it. And you see Leon Superman, this is their own name. So they put layer by layer, they constructed by, with their hands these skateboards. So bringing it to the other, uh, to the other, to the other uh, picture, let's say, other, the other part of the picture of the Fab Labs, we had the inventors uh, and aid. This is Victor from Lima, who actually went into the Fab Lab uh, to run a program um, with the Spanish cooperation, and now he w went back to Peru, and they installed the first Fab Lab in Latin America called the Fab Lab Lima. The same with Melat in Ethiopia. She now leads the digital fabrication group in uh, the Fab Lab Ethiopia itself. So as we are talking now, we are giving the power to people to produce things and actually to think broader in how we are going to produce and how we are going to live in the future. Going from just a simple chip, as Khalil did, going through furniture and maybe houses as well. As well. So yeah, we can even read, uh, build our own houses. So this is a, a, a project for a competition that it was called the Solar Decathlon Competition, and we were selected to participate uh, uh, in that competition, and the objective was to build a, a prototype of a solar house. And we said, oh, okay, shit, how do we do that? No, there was no money, uh, there were no funding, there were no companies uh, supporting us. So we said that uh, we took this, this as a challenge in order to try to fabricate uh, the bigger scale uh, object ever uh, come out from a fab lab. So uh, we brought together around 50 or 60 uh, uh, people, a group of uh, international architects, designers or non-designers, uh, and we set up uh, the, uh, the machines in our lab and we started building the whole house in pieces and then transported it in Madrid. What it is very important, it's actually, did I say that it was a competition that we totally lost? Uh, but, but we won uh, the People's Choice Award, which is actually something that helped us understand that the people uh, really feel familiar with, um, uh, with making their own things. Uh, and uh, the real value of this house is that it's a fully downloadable house. That means that all the files of fabrication, they exist in our wiki site, you can enter. Uh, we can download the files. If a similar laboratory as the one we have in Barcelona existed here in Thessaloniki, we could all go together to the lab and produce the house, the most optimum solar house of the city, uh, locally uh, in the lab in Thessaloniki. So actually we are now, um, uh, we are now preparing uh, a similar fabrication laboratory in Athens, which will be the first node of Greece and hopefully we will manage to um, spread a bit the virus uh, within the other cities. Um, uh, if we think, for example, think, how did we get 
to get our own A4 uh, insert printer. No, um, this is very much related with uh, the idea that um, uh, we produced both chairs and houses that we sold. We produced it with uh, off-the-shelf equipment. That means with machinery that exists in the market. We bought the machinery, which is a bit contradictory with the idea that we could build almost anything by ourselves. So that's why a couple of years ago we started building our own machines. So not only the objects, but also the machines that could allow us to produce these objects. So we downloaded file from the internet, we modified it, and we have created do-it-yourself um, laser cutters and 3D printers, such as the ones that you see here. For example, this is a MakerBot that it allows us to 3D print small objects for the, for the moment, uh, but we are certain we're going to reach to a bigger scale. So um, here is where the example of the inkjet, the, the printer, is entering. No? Uh, a few years ago, everything was produced in press. We would never thought that we would be able to have a printer in our house that we could print our A4 uh, seats or plot our own stuff. So a similar change we envision and we are testing in the Fab Lab that is going to happen uh, in the digital manufacturing technique with a personal fabrication. So very soon there will be no need of going uh, to, to the closest Fab Lab. Uh, we are actually will be actually able to have a lab in our house and producing our objects inside our own house. Yeah, but what, what, it, what it makes that more interesting is that uh, actually, as you said, we are not only producing objects and to see it, but actually we are producing tools. We're going beyond that. So we are talking about not technical people sharing open source software and hardware and making new tools. And to do that, you don't need to be an advanced researcher. So you are part of an international community. And if you have a computer connected to the internet, then you are part of this huge academy and, and the huge resource for um, information. It means that uh, how we understand the knowledge was produced before, that we were waiting for some universities to release some invention, or we were waiting for most of the times the militaries are the ones that produce the technology as they did with the internet and most of the things that we use today. But now, now we reach the point in which we no longer, we no longer need to sit and wait for that to happen. We have the access to the tools to make our own devices to measure the quality of the air and to measure the quality of the water if we go to the islands. We're trying to reach the islands uh, with a fab lab, hopefully. And imagine that you, don't, you really don't need to get that to uh, expensive or, or really like, uh, you know, black box knowledge. It's actually shared and open source to the internet. Um, uh, I would like you to ask a question. How many of you have something with you that you produce to design? None. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a, a very few. But this, this mainly is because, and, and, the, and also I was taking a, a frappe before. Of course, <laughs> we were taking a frappe in Greece and, and with a friend. And he was telling me, you know, we were, supposed we were uh, used to produce the 30% of the food uh, some years ago. And now we produce near the 2% of the food. <laughs> now everything else is just imported. We are now living in a model in cities and in everywhere else where, where we are concentrated in which we import the things and which are the most, you know, quantity of things that we produce? Rubbish, trash. We are producers of trash. So we just take things from China, we take the, the oranges from whatever else and the potatoes from wherever we consume it and we produce trash. And most of the times we don't do anything with that trash. We are thinking also about that if we imagine that everyone is producing with the same materials that we are doing today, then everything will collapse. So we need to go to a point in which we're using materials that are coming from our own shit. Yes, shit is very valuable today and will be the oil of the future, believe me. So the thing is that we are moving towards a model in which uh, if imagine if you produce things and then you produce shit and then your shit can help you, <laughs> can help you to produce things, you, c you have a closed loop inside, inside uh, cities. No? It's what people call permaculture, but they are only related with agri agriculture. But think about a high-tech uh, permaculture. Then the only thing that goes inside uh, our cities and, and, and where we live is just information and we share information. And if we have these production methods, we don't need anymore to use the high oil consuming uh, transportation methods to send a chair from one side of the planet to the other. I just send you the file and you produce it locally. 
This is what we are talking about. And then, if you are more fashionist, then you can think about how you <laughs> these are 3D printed dresses. Imagine this is the dream of maybe any, every, every boyfriend, no? That you simulate how they look right now, just 3D printed. You know, <laughs> that's it. That probably, it, it, it will come, it will come, it's coming, it's coming in a few years now. But the thing is that is, this is uh, said, uh, a sentence said um, 50 years ago or more, no? It, it says that it takes 30, 50 years for technology to be truly transformational. Uh, I don't know if it will be the same with what we are talking about today. I think we are just increasing the speed on how things are changing us. In the same way, we are, um, and related with the first picture of the medieval age uh, production, we are thinking that we are going towards a high-tech medieval age. Production will come back to the towns and to the cities, but really, really full of humanism. And this is what we want you to join us. So let's not wait. And if I restore. Thank you.